Hi and welcome. Um, on the stage we have uh, Gordon Ings. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about parallel programming with uh, PyOpenCL. Um, he currently works for the city of Cape Town, although this is not related to the water restrictions that they have. He came here for some water. Um, he's been in Python for plus or minus 14 years, so um, he even beats me in this, in this realm. Um, and without further ado, uh, Gordon, thank you. Great. Ah, ooh. I've, I've got a nice echo. Um, so one thing that I do, if you want stuff to go faster, more accurately, quicker on all sorts of strange devices, please chat to me. Um, I'm always interested. And uh, my main criteria for selecting jobs seems to be how difficult they are. So <laughs> don't, don't be afraid. Um, OK, so in this talk, I'm just going to talk very quickly about why you might want to consider using something like PyOpenCL, which is just the Python bindings for a uh, standard called Open, uh, heterogeneous computing standard called OpenCL. Um, and then I'm going to take you a very quick walkthrough about how to do a few pretty straightforward things in OpenCL and get you going with using things like CPUs, GPUs, and even FPGAs, so all manner of cool devices that are available to us. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how do you manipulate memory and some of the ways that memory is exposed to you within the framework. And then I'm going to tell you how to do actually do things in parallel, not just concurrently, but actually in parallel. Um, all of the code, uh, as well as the sorted cat GIFs, are available um, in th in uh, on a GitHub repo. So please feel free to take a look, send pull requests, whatever it is that people do with GitHub repos. Okay, so why uh, why do you want to learn? OpenCL, and I think really that question is, uh, why do you want to do heterogeneous computing at all? And well, the bad news is that the free lunch is over. And which free lunch am I talking about? I'm not talking about the one about an hour ago. I'm talking about this one, um, which I'm sorry if you've been to a talk that I've done before, you've probably seen this graph before. But basically that green line at the top there is something that we're all actually familiar with. And that is Moore's law. So on the y-axis we have a uh, log scale. Um, and on the x-axis, we have time. Oh, this one's a little small. Um, and basically what that says is that every 18 months since the 1970s, the amount of transistors we can put on a chip has been doubling. And that's great. Um, and for a long time, if you look at those two blue lines over there, that meant that you could write code, come back in 18 months' time, and it would just run twice as fast. Now, obviously, platforms and things changed during that time, but fundamentally, you didn't have to do much. and your computer code would just get better and better over time. But back in 2005, around the time I was learning Python, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that kind of stalled. And we hit some fundamental physical limits about what we could do, uh, how we could translate those numbers of transistors into the chip into clock frequency. So our code just stopped getting faster and faster by, vi by virtue of us doing nothing. And we started having to go down a route of doing parallel programming, having multiple cores on a chip, and then having the right software that could take advantage of those multiple cores that were available to us. Um, but there's good news in that there are alternatives. So this is a graph which, you know, and this guy is great, Carl Rupp, he regularly updates this graph, <laughs> is that um, you've got the red and we've got AMD GPUs and in the green you've got NVIDIA GPUs and this is, the, again, the log scale on the y-axis and this is double precision floating point. And as you can see, over time, they've been about an order of magnitude better than Intel commodity server-grade CPUs, which is the blue line at the bottom there. But at the same time, the power consumption has remained roughly the same. So what does that mean? It means that performance over time has been increasing at a pretty linear rate, but our power consumption has remained pretty stable. So it means that the amount of performance we're able to get per watt of energy or per watt of power is, um, is, is improving. So it does suggest, but remember, that there's an order of magnitude difference between these two. So on GPUs, we're getting increasingly better or increasingly more energy efficient at uh, doing computations. And a nice summary of this, and unfortunately, it's a bit of an old graph, 
Um, but what we have on the y-axis is the joules per mega hash for doing uh, SHA-256, or double shoot SHA-256, which is the proof of work algorithm for Bitcoin. And on the y-axis, we have mega hashes per second. Um, and what you got up there is you got the green line, which is the CPUs, you got the red lines, this is the A uh, NVIDIA GPUs, the blue lines, AMD GPUs, and then the yellow line, we have some things called FPGAs, which are basically chips that you can reprogram to implement specialist architectures. And then with the black lines, is what dominates uh, Bitcoin mining today are ASICs, basically specialized chips for doing those computations. What this graph shows us is that basically both our performance and our energy performance, so the amount of joules that we can do per calculation, improves if you're willing to work on weirder and weirder hardware. So if you're willing to uh, give up your CPU and move to other things, you can actually get quite good performance. But if you're not, you're going to hit some fundamental limitations. Okay. So this all sounds great, but there are some challenges. And I define these three challenges, and what I'm hopefully going to encourage you to do hopefully show you in this talk is that uh, PyOpenCL and OpenCL can help you address those challenges, is that firstly, there's an orientation problem. So figuring out how you get the device that you're going to be using to actually do something, like the equivalent of blinking an LED, uh, that, that's quite difficult. The next thing is the I.O. problem of actually being able to move around large bits of data efficiently and making it worth your while to, do, to use this other device. And the third thing is, and this is by far the most tricky thing, which I'm not promising anything about, is the conceptual problem of how do you take what you're trying to do and use the computing hardware available to you in the best way? How do you like match your application to your implementation? And I think that's probably what a lot of us in this room are worried about <laughs> a lot of the time. Okay, so um, in this section, I'm just going to introduce to you what an OpenCL program is how you can compile an OpenCL program, and how to run an OpenCL program. But before I do that, um, I need to tell you what, I'm, what is this OpenCL thing I keep talking about. OpenCL is a heterogeneous computing standard, and that standard is comprised of two APIs and a uh, programming language, a kernel language, as they call it. Um, but the most important thing about OpenCL is that it's managed by something called the Kronos Group, or the Kronos Consortium, uh, which has buy-in from all of the major vendors. So these are the main people who have a seat on the Kronos Group board. It was started by Apple, actually. Um, but you can see that AMD is there, ARM is there, Intel is there, NVIDIA is there, even people who've just gotten into the chip-making business, so people like Google. Uh, their imagination is another big player in this space. Um, they are giving inputs, and they're defining the standard. So what that means is that the standard, is, the standard is supported to varying degrees by devices from all of these people. So by using this one standard or subscribing to this one standard, it potentially allows you to program devices from all of these guys in a reasonably portable way. Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? I think this is enough sort of theory stuff. Let's work on some real coding. So we import uh, PyOpenCL and we import NumPy. And PyOpenCL, which is the bindings for uh, the Python API, uh, the, the OpenCL API is from Python. Um, they rely very heavily on NumPy, and I'll show you in a little while why that needs to be the case. And so the first thing we want to do is this PyOpenCL get platforms uh, function, which queries our system and looks for OpenCL platforms or implementations that are available to us. And you can see this is actually ran this on my laptop, and I have three different implementations available to me. I have one from Intel, one from uh, NVIDIA and another one called uh, POCL, or the Portable Computing Language. And the sharp eyed among you will notice that the NVIDIA one says CUDA. And you actually might have heard of CUDA, which is a programming framework for NVIDIA GPUs. And actually, the way that NVIDIA supports Pi op uh, OpenCL is by taking your OpenCL code, translating it into CUDA code, and then putting it through their CUDA tools. So it's actually just a way, a convoluted way, really, to talk to the CUDA tools if you don't feel like learning CUDA. <laughs> Um, but then if you want to actually use um, the, a particular implementation, I've got a, just a little snippet of code to select the first uh, platform that is called NVIDIA CUDA. So I'm selecting the NVIDIA, the NVIDIA platform, and then I'm selecting, uh, I'm going, I'm selecting the NVIDIA devices within that platform. Now, just to talk a little bit about the programming abstractions that OpenCL introduces. So this is the programming API that 
OpenCL exposes and exposed in Python via PyOpenCL. Um, everything underlined is words that have special meaning. So you have a program that has uh, special functions in it called kernels, and you do a compilation process, and that produces binaries. And uh, those binaries are then bound to a particular context, and that context is tied to a platform, so a particular vendor's implementation. And within that context, there are certain devices with which have a corresponding command queue associated with them. And that command queue can then be used to invoke the kernels that are compiled. Um, don't worry if most of that you know, didn't land. Just know that the most important thing is that you have special functions called kernels that we're going to be calling. Okay, so now we're going to build a very simple program using this programming API. And the example I'm going to be using throughout is a very simple vector sum. So vector sum, very simply, we've got an array A and we've got an array B, and we want to add those arrays together element by element. So we want to add the first element of A to the first element of B, the second element of A to the second element of B, Etc. I think you guys get the idea. <laughs> and then store the and take a look at that. So here we're getting the NVIDIA context, and you can see that I'm telling it which devices I'm going to be using inside that context, and they have to come from the same platform. Um, and then I've got some, the program source. And don't worry, I'm not going to just use multi-line strings for my program source, uh, but I just really wanted to impress upon you how simple or how little OpenCL code you might in fact need to write. So what we got here is we've got a function, and if you know a bit of C, you'll recognize, or even Java, you will recognize what this looks like. We've got something called sum, it's a function called sum, and kernels by definition are always void functions. Um, we're passing in some pointers to things called A, B, and C. Uh, then we're getting an ID of some sort, and don't worry again, I'll get into what that ID means in a little while. And we're taking the element from A that corresponds to that ID, the element from B, corresponds to that ID, and we're adding them together and storing the result in C. Now what we've done is we've taken that source string, and it really just is a multi-line string. Um, we've created a program object, and then we're calling a, um, a, a method on that object which is build. And that's it. That's how you compile code to run, well this is how I have to compile code to run on the GPU on my laptop. So then, and this is where some of the nice things about using something like a language like Python to do, do the host side code, as it's called, or the, stu the stuff that interacts with the APIs, is that it's dynamically will bind um, the kernel names as methods onto the compiled object. So I'm here querying the kernel object that I built. You can see that it says, oh, what kernels do I have available to me? I have one called sum, which is the name of the kernel that we just compiled, right? Cool. So now we need to actually run the code. And this is the second API, the runtime API. Um, I'm going to talk in a little while about the memory copy operations. But broadly speaking, we put events onto the command queue. Remember the thing uh, up here, the command queue that's associated with the device. So we be putting events on them. And they can be memory copies, or they can be invocations of our kernel. But by default, OpenCL is a batch synchronous parallel frame programming framework. What does that actually mean? It means that whenever we call the kernel, there's always a big loop above that kernel. And each instance, each iteration of that loop is called a work item. And those work items are grouped into what are called work groups. And those execute on our device, and there's going to be some memory available on that device, which those work items can interact with. I'll get into the details of the memory stuff in a little while. So what does this actually look like inside the Python binding? Okay, first I'm just going to show you uh, what the code looks like a little bit. So this is a little function that I'm writing, which is to run the kernel. So as an argument, I'm passing the command queue, I'm passing the kernel name that I'm interested in, and by this I mean the, the method that's associated with my program I just built. A global size, which is the no number of iterations of that big loop of work items that I want to run. Um, then I'm passing some input tuples and output tuples, and I'll explain what those are in a second. And then I'm specifying the local size, which is the number of work items per work group. Again, this is a detail I'll get into in a little while. First thing we're going to do is we're going to do some copy operations. Um, so we're calling the OpenCL a copy, and we're specifying a source, and we're specifying a destination. And that's where the input tuple comes in, because in that tuple, there's a uh, source array, and there's a buffer. And that array is a NumPy array, and the buffer is a des is a object that we're going to create, which represents the memory on the device. Um, then we're 
constructing some arguments which we're going to be passing into our kernel. And the arguments that we're passing in is just the names of uh, the buffers that we want it to work on. So that's going to be what our A and our B and our C. And then we actually execute the kernel. And that's all you need to do to actually execute the kernel, that one line. And then we're going to copy the result off. And then right at the end, we're waiting for all the work to finish. Okay, but this is a bit abstract. Let's see it in practice. Oh, before we actually see it in practice, we need to make sure that what we're doing is making sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we're creating a C reference result in this function over here where we're adding A plus B. Um, we're then taking away that number from our C, getting the absolute, and then we're looking to see at any point has the number, do the numbers differ from each other when we take our reference calculation, which we've done on our host CPU versus what we've done on our device. So here we go. This is what, here we're going to actually implement it. We're going to do a million numbers, um, two to the 20, two to the power of 20. We're generating two arrays. They're going to be uh, NumPy uh, floats and uh, we're creating a destination array, which is our C, so we're going to make it empty to start off with. Then what we do is we're creating our buffer objects, and I'll get into that in a second, because that's, that's to do with the memory system of OpenCL. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to create a command queue that's associated to our context. Remember, the context has our device inside it. And then we're going to actually um, create those input tuples, which remember is the pairing of the source array and the destination buffer, or the source buffer and the destination array, which we're gonna copy. And then we're gonna run our code. Cool, and then we're going to check our results and we see, great, what we did on the GPU is exactly the same as what was on the CPU. Okay, another thing that you're no doubt going to be interested in is how long does this take to run? So luckily things, IPython has this nice magic function, time it. So uh, that's why I actually instantiated the whole program execution, which includes the memory copy, um, all in one function, so I can do things like just call the timeit function on it and ev quickly evaluate how quickly it's running, right? Don't worry too much about the standard deviation in that case because, you know, we're doing a relatively small number of runs. Um, okay, so manipulating memory. So you've seen now the basics of how you use the OpenCL uh, the runtime API and the programming, AT, uh, the programming API and the runtime API to actually run programs. Let's talk a little bit more about how memory works in this whole system and how you move data around. That second problem I identified. Okay, so the abstractions that OpenCL introduces is um, there's global memory and there's constant memory and any work item on the device can access those things. Now, because remember I told you that the work items, those iterations of our big loop can be grouped together into work groups, they can actually share access to something called local memory. And then, as the name might suggest, individual work items can access private memory. Now, you might be wondering, or you might be starting to be suspicious about this description of uh, work items as just iterations of a big loop. And yeah, the truth is that standard makes no guarantee in which work items are going to be evaluated or in fact whether they might be evaluated in parallel. So that's why you've got to be quite careful when you think about what memory your work items are going to be operating on because they might be, you, you have no control over when they're going to be executed. All of that is handed over to the uh, subsystem, the, the OpenCL subsystem. Okay, so let's just look a little bit more carefully at what it looks like to use global memory. So I've got two functions here where I'm creating input memory and I'm creating output memory. And again, you can see I'm just, giving input arrays and output arrays and a context, and I'm creating buffers inside those contexts. And the one thing that I want to highlight to you here is that you can give certain flags to those buffers, and those flags are always with respect to the code that's running on the device. So you see read-only memory, that means that the device can only ever read from that memory buffer inside your kernel. But that obviously means that on the host side, the other side of that transaction, it can only ever write to that memory. So it's very simple. You can only ever write to read-only memory. Okay. <laughs> then vice versa, on uh, output memory, you can only ever write to that from within your OpenCL kernel, and you can only ever read from it from your host code. You can, of course, choose a memory flag 
read-write, which means you can both read and write to it. And for simplicity reasons, often that's a nice thing to do. But there are performance implications. The more hints you can give to the subsystem about how certain types of memory are going to be used will allow it to do more optimization on its own. So generally, it's a good idea to try to stick to read only and write only if you can. OK, so here we go. You're generating, uh, again, I'm generating that data. I'm creating my input tuples and my output tuples. And yay, the results work right. Yep. So let's see how the, what are the implications of this inside our system. Well, what we might decide to do is we might say, let's, let me try rather batch accesses to, well, let me try batching my work inside my system. So each work item is going to do m a bit more work, right? And so what we're doing is inside my work item, I actually have a real loop. And in that loop, I'm going to be adding the two numbers together and storing them there. And what I'm actually doing, you can see that the, the, uh, the identifier line is getting, the ID line is getting a little bit more complicated because I have to take into account the fact that each thing is doing little loops and striding through my memory structure. And if we run it again, uh, I don't know if you remember, but last time uh, our performance was about two and a half milliseconds. So we've made things quite a lot worse. <laughs> so I wonder what is going on here. Um, would anyone like to guess maybe? Why it is that the batched memory act or the, the batch uh, execution mode might be in fact performing a lot worse than uh, doing the individual ones. And it's nothing to do with parallelism, I promise you. Well, it's a little bit to do with parallelism. <laughs> so what's, as far as I can tell what's happening is that there's, you're creating huge memory contention on your global memory because for each iteration of those internal loops, doing two concurrent accesses to the global memory and each, each work item is now doing a batch size of those things. And before, there was all sorts of other things happening that it could allow to hide, like the startup of work items and things. But now, because each work item is spending a lot more time trying to do memory accesses, I think they're colliding a lot more. Okay, so what about this local pr and private memory? And I'm actually not gonna talk about local memory straight away. I'm gonna talk about private memory. So you will have noticed that Inside my kernel, when I was dealing with global memory, those global memories actually get a little annotation at the front there, which is, says global in my function definition up there. It says global float pointer A, right? And what I'm now doing is that any memory that is not uh, got that annotation in front of it, doesn't have global or local in front of it, any variable declaration, which is what my third line is over there, my float A temp, my float B temp, my float C temp, so that automatically goes into private memory. And so what I'm doing is I'm first copying everything into my, um, into that private memory buffer that I've created. So I'm trying to do all of my memory accesses at once as one big group. And we hope that the compiler is able to uh, batch those accesses together. We're then going to do our operations on our local private memory, and then we're going to get the results out. So cool, what happens when we actually run this? Eh, okay, we're back at two and a half milliseconds now. So we're able to do fewer work items, but uh, we're still, we haven't made the performance. And that's because in our original case, um, the compiler, the NVIDIA compiler was actually able to probably do something like this itself behind the scenes. So we've just effectively re-implemented what the compiler did. <laughs> okay, so now actually to talk a little bit more about how things are done in parallel inside OpenCL. Um, so before I get into the OpenCL stuff, the immediate thing I want to point out is another nice thing is that the runtime API lets us inspect, both the runtime and program API, lets us inspect the characteristics of the device that are available to us. So I've got a little bit of code here, and I'm just showing you uh, my, you looking at the Intel platform, for example. And what I'm doing over here is I'm iterating over the various properties and I'm printing some of them out over here. And this is actually the onboard graphics card that's in my laptop. It has a separate NVIDIA graphics card and has a graphics card that actually sits on the same chip as the processor. And you can see that it knows that it's a GPU. It has 23 compute units, and I'll talk in a second about what a compute unit is. It runs at about 1.1 uh, gigahertz. It has, um, it's about four gigabytes of constant memory available to it. It has about 12 gigabytes of global memory available to it. And it has 64K of local memory available to it. And that actually corresponds, my system has 16 gigabytes of RAM, four gigabytes of it are being used as constant memory, 12 are being used as global memory. And then the 64K refers to a specific property inside the 
the GPU. So it's probably a cache inside the GPU that Intel have implemented. But someone has written a really cool uh, utility. It was originally AMD. Used to, it used to come with the AMD implementation, but uh, someone has open sourced it and uh, just written a generic one that works for everything called CL Info. Um, and uh, here I'm executing it on the shell and it will print out everything. And this goes on forever and ever. You see it scroll past now. Uh, <laughs> So there's huge amounts of information that's available to you about your devices, and that matters with respect to how you match your application to the device. So to talk about the different types of parallelism a little bit more, remember I told you that all of our work items, it's basically a giant list, and then you can think of maybe a second thing, which a second uh, level to that, uh, sorry, giant loop, and the second level to that loop is the work groups inside that loop. Well, generally the idea there is, is that work groups are something that you can execute in what's called a task parallel way. So different work groups can be doing different things at the same time. Whereas within a work group, the work items will be executed in a data parallel way. Now this isn't a requirement of the standard. So this just means when we say a data parallel way, what we mean is we're going to be doing the same operation just onto different parts of the data potentially. And I'll give you an example in a second what that looks like. But what matters for this is that it's giving you a hint to say to you, if you have some sort of application where you need to be doing radically different things at the same time, you need to try and get those, those bits of work into different work groups. And if you're going to be doing things that where you're doing the same operation, but it's going to be on different bits of the data, say different parts of an array, you must try and get those into a work group together. And then the, you can take advantage of maybe the data parallelism that's available to you in the architecture. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And this is taking advantage of the data parallelism that comes available, is that OpenCL gives you some quite crazy uh, types. So the float 16 variable type in the function definition over there is actually 16 floats that are right next to each other. And what you can do is you can in interact with them and uh, do operation like A plus B on those float 16s, and it will do the vector, vector sum across those 16 operations. Now what you're telling the compiler is you're saying, okay, I want you to take 16 floats and I want you to add them to this other 16 floats. So you're doing the same operation across 16 different variables all at once. And that's a very unambiguous way of saying to it, hey, can you use some data parallelism on this. So when we actually run it, we see we get actually get a small improvement um, because now the compiler knows for sure that, certain that things are going to definitely be overlapping. And now I'm going to introduce the local memory I talked about, which is the memory that within a work group uh, is the access is shared, because what we're going to do now is we're going to share the access to the global memory, which, remember before, my theory was that it was, there was lots of conflicts of that when we were trying to access it from everything all at once. So what we're doing, we're still working with the float 16s, but I'm now using a slightly different semantic. We're not just accessing those arrays directly. We're copying, we're using that async workgroup copy, which is a special function in the, the OpenCL language. And we're copying two local arrays. And you can see that I've declared those arrays with that local identifier at the beginning of uh, there. And we're copying them. And there's no guarantee that work items within a work group will execute uh, in a data parallel fashion. But you can use synchronization between them. And that's what uh, those async workgroup copies do. They, they actually, all, everything in the workgroup will stop and they will fetch everything together. They'll, they'll work together. And then what we're doing is inside our, uh, we're still doing our A plus B and we're storing it in C. And then we're doing the same thing again where we're copying all of our results. Okay, and we've now actually seen a bit of a speed up. Now we are running, if you remember before, it was uh, about two and a half milliseconds to do add a million numbers together. Um, it's now taking us just under two milliseconds to add those two numbers together. So that's pretty cool. But what about NumPy? So if you know uh, what NumPy is, it's a library in Python that breaks all of the nice uh, type inference that Python does for us, um, but it does it in the name of performance. Um, and what it does is, it, it just wraps very thinly uh, C or Fortran implementations of various operations. And in this case, um, as you can imagine, adding two numbers together, there's a hang of an implement, uh, optimized implementation for that. So if we run that, 
that runs in about a quarter of a time of even our best uh, OpenCL implementation. <laughs> so what was the point of all of that? Um, so just to summarize, we want to add a million number, floating point numbers together. That's not a small number of no amount of numbers. <laughs> um, we, uh, it took us at best two milliseconds to do it on our GPU, but it took us half, almost half a millisecond, well, just over half a millisecond to just do it on our CPU completely sequentially. So, the reason for that is, there's many different reasons for why that is the case. So does anyone want to hazard a guess? Anyone who's done any sort of HPC out the back there? That's great, so I'm just gonna repeat that for the recording. Uh, the answer was copying stuff to the GPU is expensive. You can exactly see that, right? That we're doing just one floating point addition, we're adding A to B, but to do that, we need to do two memory fetches and we need to do a memory right back. And if you know something about, uh, if for example, our global memory is implemented in RAM, you know something about the timings of these things, the access to RAM is hundreds of cycles compared to the few cycles that we would use to uh, do the actual floating point addition. So we're gonna even the score a little bit over here. And what I'm doing over here is we're doing um, the A plus B, but then we're going to raise it to a power, right? And um, I'm not entirely sure about the maths notation there, um, but we're trying to do the, the, the vector-wide, the vector -wide, um, element-wise raising to the power, right? And so we're just using the power function over there and we're raising it to some predefined power, which I've made a thousand. And when we run our OpenCL implementation, it's um, now crept up a little bit to 3.26 milliseconds. And that's, you know, if you think about it, like that's a crazy amount of work that we've just increased it by, but actually it's only gone up by just over 50%, which tells us something about uh, uh, how much of the memory copy is taking versus actually the actual computation. And if we do this with our actual um, NumPy, now you'll see that our GPU implementation was roughly 10 times faster because we did that A plus B and we then raised it to the power and the sequential one took almost 25 milliseconds. And I've had it run a lot slower actually. Um, but of course, we're also going to run into all sorts of weird problems. So this is a bit of a toy problem because of overflow. Okay, so just before I finish off, there's some caveats I want to share with you. Now, uh, I was very excited that in the previous talk, someone mentioned uh, Amdahl's law. So what Amdahl's law says is that as the number of processes available to you um, approaches infinity, the amount you can speed up your code is always going to be inherently limited by how much of that code can be executed in parallel. So if you have any bottleneck, any point where you need to add a bunch of numbers together to get your final result, that will become your bottleneck. And what that means in practice is that even if 95% of your code can run in parallel, which is quite, a, it's quite unusual, my experience is it's much often closer to something like 80%, your, limit, your speed up is always going to be limited to 20. Um, and what's even more amazing is that Gene Umdahl formulated this back in the 60s, so he was way ahead of us, he saw this coming. <laughs> then the other thing uh, that I think is important is uh, my favorite, far oh, one of my favorite XKCD comics, is this one which says um, how much time you should spend on a task versus how much time do you shave off. Going from something like Python, which is lovely and expressive and flows really easily, um, really doesn't, um, uh, you know, to something like o the OpenCL kernel language, which is essentially a restricted form of C, is not the easiest of transitions. And so it often takes you quite a long time to rewrite your application to be suited to the OpenCL kernel. So you need to think quite carefully, how much time am I willing to invest versus how much do I need to shave off what I'm doing to actually make this effort worthwhile. And it's always a good thing to have at the back of your mind. There's definitely cases where it is appropriate, but really please do keep it in the back of your mind. Okay, so thank you for listening. Um, and yeah, is there any questions? Um, what have you guys used um, OpenCL for the city of Cape Town? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why I asked at the beginning to make it clear that uh, the good citizens of Cape Town are definitely not subsidizing uh, GPU acceleration work. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, this, is, this is something that I did in a past life when I was uh, doing research as an academic. 
Um, and then as I mentioned on the side as a, a ap ap application acceleration consultant. And what I mostly did when I was doing research was Monte Carlo simulations, and then more recently I've been doing some, accelerating some machine learning, actually data preparation steps. So essentially taking a lot of data, uh, making it a bit more manageable before it's about to be fed into some learning algorithms. Are there any ways of diagnosing where your bottlenecks are? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think that's uh, there, there's quite a few different tools. Um, Intel has some really nice ones. I really, in general, I quite like the Intel tooling. Um, there's stuff that can, basically the term people often use is you look for hotspots in your code. What you wanna do is understand what bits of your code are the things that are being run Lots, or where, where is most of the time inside your program being spent? And there's a couple of different, you can either have some sort of simulator that runs your code and very carefully keeps, keeps track of what you're doing, but actually in modern CPUs, there's performance counters that can do that too. So um, yeah, it, 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 it tends to be quite application specific, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of different tools you can apply. Um, and I think that's, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Just Google uh, hotspot analysis or hotspot code analysis. Any other questions? Yeah, something I always try and do for uh, talks is have have a recommended uh, lead reading list. So, um, and I, I tried to put some of these in the the Git repo. So. Oh, last question. My question might be out off scope, but um, with cloud vendors, how, f how well do you find the OpenCL supported? No, that's actually a fantastic question. Um, so, and I think the cloud uh, develop the clouds, uh, the emergence in the last few years of certain platforms on the cloud has made stuff accessible to people. So, uh, a V100 NVIDIA GPU. I think is going for 10 to 20,000 Rand, right? Oh, it's about closer to 20,000 Rand, right? Um, but uh, you can rent one from AWS uh, or Google Compute for, I think it's less than a dollar an hour. So, and remember, as long as you've got a, sta a, a virtual machine which has that GPU attached to it, uh, and you can get the right drivers onto that GPU, or to, to talk to that GPU, you can use OpenCL on it. So that's actually how I mostly use OpenCL, is on some sort of cloud platform. Uh, and a notable mention here is that AWS have a, um, an FPGA, which supports uh, open, an OpenCL tool flow. So you can actually use OpenCL to program FPGAs in the cloud. And those devices are tens of thousands of US dollars. Uh, so to get access to that for a couple of dollars an hour at most is, is, is quite cool. Cool, thank you very much. Um. <laughs>